Yeah, well, I had to, I've, al I've always, um, uh, I always have kind of been into graphics and art and uh -huh. painting and stuff, and and um, uh, uh, I slowly moved into photography. Still. As still photography, uh -huh. you know, it's just a kind of pastime. Uh, uh, and well, then, how old were you then? Uh, I was about. This was, you know, I was in high school. I was mainly interested in cars, and I was working for. Uh, foreign car service and racing uh -huh. sports cars and working on that racing teams and stuff and I ended up through photography by taking pictures of cars at the races uh, when I came down here uh, to Los Angeles I didn't know anything about film I didn't know anybody in the film business and I was completely lost you know did you want in? and, and I wanted in you know just like everybody else I wanted to get in and I had applied to SC but I hadn't been accepted and I had applied to UCLA and I hadn't been accepted and uh, uh, so I was, you know, wanted to learn about the film business. And Didn't you, hadn't you been exposed to all the talk, all the, all the negative talk about Hollywood and how one shouldn't get into that horrible business and all that? that? Really? No? Yeah, a small town, you know. I mean, there was no intellectualizing of it. It was just uh -huh. movies, you know. Uh -huh. And it wasn't movies as much as it was film that moved, mm -hmm. you know. And it was, um, uh, when I got into it, I was, I was more fascinated in the, just the medium. You know, the the fact that it moved, you know, that real <laughs> childish intrigue of, gosh, look at the thing, it moves, and, you know, and I, you know, it came a, became a kind of obsession, I and mean, a kind of uh -huh. real desire to watch things move, and to photograph them What movement. things? I mean, did, did you have, like, I mean, it just, didn't matter? It started, uh... I mean, didn't you have dreams that you wanted to, to make real, and that's why you wanted to make movies, you know? The, no. uh, one gets the image of a filmmaker having these... You know, uh, making a film just so he can realize his fantasies or something. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I got into it. I mean, I think of myself as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. and uh, I got into an argument once at a, at a film conference with uh, with George Cooker, who really doesn't like the, the word filmmaker. I mean, he likens it to toy maker, and I think that's a real nice thing. I like being thought of as a toy maker that makes films, and that's how I got into it. Is I was fascinated mm -hmm. with the mechanics of it. I mean, you know, coming out of cars and what have you. I was fascinated with the fact that you could take real life and put it onto an image and make it move and you could manipulate it. Real life. Play with it. Real life. Whatever you were to photograph. <laughs>
After Colorado nods to you, sir, then you just glance at the old and you. put your hatchet I away. Okay. Okay. Right. All right, quiet. We're rolling. Right. Roll. <coughs> when you're ready, when you're ready, Dave, I just didn't want to keep holding. Okay. 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 We're rolling. Here we go. Roll. 43, take one. 44, take one. We're rolling, please. Roll. Action. Hold it. You know, we've been trading that old man for two weeks now. Uh, not knowing anything at all about the industry and then getting involved r really right up at the top with one of the best cameramen and so forth at the time. Um, did, did you encounter any shocking experiences? Were you, were you uh, disillusioned with, uh, well, you know, the working conditions or, or, or you didn't know enough yet to be yeah, I didn't know enough. All I, all I really found out was that unions wouldn't let you in the, in the, <laughs> into Hollywood. That was the first thing I found out and mainly because Haskell tried to get me a job in several different areas and every time the union stopped us, you know, and I, even production assistant, they, they stopped, it was a ridiculous situation on that mm -hmm. film. And so I eventually didn't end up on the film. And so I, essentially I turned my back on Hollywood. I said, I'm not interested in that anyway. So mm -hmm. I'll just go to film school and learn about film and I don't really care. So by the time you were at SC, you did have some, uh, more, had, more than the general knowledge of what goes on in the industry then. No, 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 no. no. I didn't really get on a film set with I see, Haskell. I, I mean, he kept trying. That's the only thing I really found out was the door was completely closed and there was a solid brick wall, at least 12 feet high, around the whole thing. <laughs> the one thing is SC, the great thing that a film school did was that it exposed me to a lot of film. And I was just, you know, enthralled. I mean, I, all these... Oh, you started seeing a lot of then, movies. Then, I mean, you go to movies all day long. That's all you ever do there. Uh -huh. And it was really an experience. You know, that's when I really got excited about film, and I just kind of went crazy. Because when I went in, I kind of ambled in. And I kind of, mm -hmm. well, let's look and see what's behind this door. You know, because I didn't know what I was... You know, I was like any other, you know, kid... 18 years old. I didn't know what in the world I was going to do with my life and where I was going. And, and uh, you know, uh, and I just stumbled into this film you, school. And then there I was. And it was like the most incredible thing I'd ever witnessed in my life. Uh huh. Uh, I really think of film as a language. I mean, mm -hmm. really, uh, I mean, the, the putting together of images and sounds in such a way as, as to convey uh, an experience, a meaning that you simply cannot convey in any other way at all. Right. And this, this little short had a kind of a dynamic quality uh, uh, that was really appealing. You know, the way it begins with this uh, uh, droning music, uh, was it the Yardbirds music or some, mm. some organ type well, of a drone. Organ. Uh -huh. And these, these colored lights going over the black, uh, black frame and, and so forth. Uh, you know, you would look at that and get an immediate feeling, some kind mm. of an impact. But you, if you really analyze what it was, you, you don't know. So right. like, it was that, and I've been trying to carry that through. It, it was a feeling, and that's when I did it. Mm -hmm. I felt that 
and it was a strange thing because I felt that that was right, and I put that that way, and I felt it when I ran it. Mm -hmm. I felt it, and I said, yeah, that works. And uh, when you get into a bigger film, it becomes an extremely difficult thing to do. When you're in a little controlled situation, you can put something in that you feel, right. and it's very easy to do uh, because the, the, what you're dealing with is fluid enough to where there's no set rigid things that you have to meet. I mean, just feels yeah. good. You can just put it there, and that's the only reason for it being there. Did you find that it was not possible to work that way when you got into uh, the On big? a feature, if you try to explain that to a uh, studio executive that it feels right, they go crazy. Uh -huh. And they say, and because they don't feel it, because I don't think they feel anything, uh -huh. they they won't let you do it. You know, they just they uh, you know you put it in there and well, you eventually have just a, cut out. I have a, I have a question. <laughs> How did these very sensitive and beautiful films get made? Quite frankly, I don't know, by, by luck, I think. You know, it also, at the times, I mean, when, when I started, the, like the feature effects, mm -hmm. we were in a real little, you know, about eight-month renaissance there. Of, mm -hmm. All of a sudden, there was freedom, mainly because of Easy Rider. Easy Rider did a great thing, and, but it didn't last for very long. <laughs> and the feature was started in that atmosphere of total freedom. You mm -hmm. know, these kids are crazy, but we'll let them do it because it seems to make money. Well... When I finished the film, I mean, so when I started the film, I had all kinds of freedom, the, the feature. I st had all kinds of freedom, but when I finished the film, when I had, was down to a rough cut, and then I was putting in those feeling things, this mm -hmm. feels right, and it seems to work, and it seemed to work to everybody around me, uh, the studio saw it and went crazy, because then that was when Airport had come out. And then <laughs> on top of that, right, you know, in the middle of our battles with the studio, and trying to convince them, that, yes, this works, that you may, you know, it works, honest, it works, we showed it to an audience, it works. Then Love Story came out, and they were even more convinced that they didn't care really what a preview audience thought. All they cared about is what they thought, and they were right, you know. Their mind yeah. is, the, well, is the mind that makes the difference. Well, And so that stuff ended up getting out. And as I say, at a time, it runs in phases, you know, like art or anything else. I mean, yeah. there are times when everything is kind of relaxed and you're really free times right now are very hard and there's not very much yeah. freedom. It all depends on the person too. Kubrick can do anything he wants. You but got into film primarily, uh, the motivation was not that you had something that you wanted to say, but that you had a language and you just fell in love with the language and right. something to say would come later. Right. Huh? And right. What, what came later was what, THX, right? Your, right. your first film. Yeah, well, most of my first student films were very, um, very uh, technical, technically oriented. You know, they uh -huh. were mostly visual exercises and and, and the first sex was really a visual exercise. And uh, uh, it, was a, it was done as a lighting test. And I was uh -huh. teaching a class over at SC. And it, uh, uh, now, just now I'm beginning to get into saying things. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, saying, I was... Well, that was, that was what, about a 15-minute student film made in when, 1968 or 67 or 8? Yeah, 68, uh -huh. I think. It was finished in... I remember at the time I, I was... Uh, writing some film criticism and, and everyone including me everyone was impressed with the technical quality of the film it, it was one of the few films that one had seen at that time in which there was a substantial portion shot off of a television uh, mm -hmm. tube and so forth and it did have this rather uh kinky futuristic quality about it and this this was very impressive and also um ha having just seen it this morning um uh, i realized that that also that film was like it's a chase sequence, the, right. the entire film. And I realize that that's why it works, because it's just that. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there are built-in factors in a chase that, you know... It's a very simple idea. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it was done that way because it was a lighting test. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I couldn't shoot a film. You know, I had to shoot something very simplistic that I could put together uh -huh. and would be interesting. You know? I think that, you know, THX uh, has won a lot of awards. I'm, I'm talking about the early, uh, yeah. the, uh, early film, which... I understand has be, uh, been retitled now to Electronic Labyrinth or something. Uh, yeah, the school did that for, for copyright uh -huh. reasons. And uh, but it's won whether it's a, a national student film competition, yeah. what, once or twice? Huh? Or, uh, or just, can, once. just once. It, uh, it won there, it won Oberhausen and uh -huh. in, uh, uh -huh. Edinburgh and a lot of places. Uh -huh. So evidently, it, uh, uh, most people think that it has more value than just the lighting test. <laughs> well, yeah. and me included. I mean, it was there.
everybody about that short THX was its professionalism. I mean, it was really a professional movie uh, uh, coming out of a, you know, a professional student movie coming out of a, an ambiance in which one seldom found that kind of uh, professional approach. And that's probably what led you to the next step, which was going on to American Zotrope and working for Francis Ford Coppola, or with him. Yeah, it uh, actually was uh, on the basis of that film that I got a scholarship to go to Warner Brothers which I kind of just took on a lark. A scholarship? Yeah, they have a work scholarship where you get to work at a major studio for six months, you know, for, you know, about a little bit of money, and, uh, you know, uh -huh. you go there every day and uh, watch them make movies. That's how I met Francis, was on one of those scholarships. Oh, you didn't have to make, uh, it was just to be there, just to Yeah, you just observe. observe. It was a really mm -hmm. kind of ridiculous thing, because, you know, you watch them make features, and you mm -hmm. can, you watch them for about two days, and you know everything there is to know about and I making. remember around that time, Francis, had a, you know, the maverick, the enfant terrible of Hollywood, where he was going to, he had just made You're a Big Boy Now, and was making, uh, what, Finnegan's... Finnegan's Rainbow. Rainbow. Of course, that was a very Hollywood thing. It was yeah. as a result of that. And uh, our friendship, I was very kind of anti-Hollywood, and he was too, really, you know. But how, how did you get anti-Hollywood all of a sudden, having, having never made a movie in Hollywood yet? Uh... Well, I was disposed against it, mainly because of my first experience in coming, trying to get a job, you know, mm. with Haskell and what have you, and not being able to, 
mm. and you know being shut out and I thought that was extremely unfair so I was disposed against it I the only reason I took the scholarship was to give it a chance so I'll go and see what it's all about just what, so I can say I really don't like it what you saw you didn't like and what I saw I didn't like and uh, I wanted was trying very desperately to get into animation over at Warner Brothers and uh, then Francis and I you know became friends and everything because we were the only two people under 50 on the crew <laughs> and uh, then he decided as a result of that to go off and do the rain people and, and out of that developed American zoetrope where now, we would what, what was that what, what was zoetrope or what is it or? well it was an idea of the fact that you really don't have to be in Los Angeles to make films or Hollywood. You can make them anywhere. Make them anywhere in the world. Uh, all you have to do is have the knowledge. I mean, the facilities that they have here, you can have anywhere. You know, all you need is a camera. And uh -huh. You can buy a camera. So we essentially bought a camera and moved to San Francisco. I uh -huh. said, we're going to make movies up here, and uh, we don't need The Hollywood. stories I heard were, were a little more elaborate than that. The, well, the word went out that Zotrope had the state-of-the-art technology, and you had all these uh, fabulous uh, we, pieces of equipment. We got a lot of new equipment in, and uh, uh, we had problems getting it working and stuff. A lot of experimental equipment. You know, mm. we were, you know, it's cheaper because it's experimental, I mean, because nobody uses it. Uh -huh. So uh, we were going out on a limb on a lot of equipment and stuff. And, Literally, Francis had made enough money on the rain people and what have you to invest his in everything that he earned in buying equipment to make American Zotro mm -hmm. work. And then we got the deal, you know, after about two years of fighting for it, we finally got the deal to make Thex. And on the basis of Thex, we made enough money, again, the, to make Zotro go for another year. Mm -hmm. And uh, But then as a result of our disagreements with uh, Warner Brothers over the final cut of uh, THX, we ended up uh, losing a lot of our projects that we were going to be doing for them. I take it you're a bit embittered about this whole business uh, with, with, with Warner Brothers, or, or not, not that, uh, just the whole way of doing business in general in the industry. Yeah, I, it, it's a fact of uh, uh, kind of resentment, I guess, that everyone feels when one finds that uh, somebody who has the money, or has the, as a result of the money, has the power to make decisions that are out of their area, you know, but because they have the power and because they have the money, uh, they can make like aesthetic directorial writing decisions, mm -hmm. which they have really no business making. Uh, and it's, you know, it's in this country, the dollar is above the individual. A man's brain, a man's experience, a man's talent is below the dollar. The man with yeah. the dollar is the final sake. You seem to have arrived at a position that's uh, perhaps opposite from the one that we started talking about this morning was where you said that you be became interested in film having no real con conceptions about it but simply wanting to make images that move right. together with sounds and now your experience with the industry has perhaps turned you around where you you now have very definite conceptions yeah. and just making images is not enough anymore. No, I'm moving toward the, you know, another kind of film. Francis was in the, the kind of film that was exactly the opposite. I mean, I learned a lot from Francis' this type of, you know, theatrical, stage-oriented, you know, drama-oriented filmmaking. You, you like that? Uh, I'm moving toward it. I'm learning. I'm growing. I'm trying to, uh -huh. you know, see what it's all about. It, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to play and moving, moving around. I'm growing. Uh -huh. I hope. I was interested in the sound montages, the sound collages uh, in these, in the sections where there's a lot of action going along, a lot, a lot of people, uh -huh. and you hear uh, electronic conversations and so uh -huh. forth. Was this done? Um, you sh I take it you shot those sequences silent, and then somebody composed these right. sound. Uh, Walter Murch, who also worked on the script with me and uh, we went to school with me. We worked together. He's a real sound man. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, he did most of the sound work and the montages, what have you. And uh, the one problem is that that's one of the things that Warner Brothers altered considerably. It was much more abstract and much more musical. The film was designed as a kind of opera, you know, kind of musical science fiction film. <laughs> uh, and the, the soundtrack was com composed under, you know, Purely uh -huh. musical concepts, and uh, they didn't quite understand that. They thought uh -huh. it had to all tell a story. And so, what essentially the biggest change is they've injected more story, what they thought was a story. That's the story of. Uh, they took out all uh, the humor and the happiness and people laughing and mm -hmm. stuff. Because they well, didn't you know, we've. The, I mean, everyone's heard, you know. By this time in history, I think it's become a bit of a cliche to uh, sit around and talk about how, how bad Hollywood is mm -hmm. because, you know, how many books we have and so forth about it and what we know about, about, about that kind of production. But what, what, what interests me is that you've said that on the basis of this one experience with this one film, they withdrew 
their financial support of all seven or six other projects that Zoetrope had going. I can't understand. I mean, what, what has your film got to do with another, say? Well, it was essentially Francis was the producer. Mm -hmm. And so it was Francis who had stuck his... Stuck, stuck himself out on a limb to make the movie. You know, they were doing it purely on Francis's name, mm -hmm. and they weren't doing it because they liked my mm -hmm. films or they thought I was talented or anything. Because they don't know, they don't respect talent, and they don't realize that it means anything to them. Mm -hmm. So they just they did it purely on Francis's reputation. And then, and then when they realized that Francis was letting me do whatever I want, I mean, he, you know, he would make suggestions, and I would listen to him because he's a filmmaker and he's an intelligent person. But if I said, no, I don't think that's a good idea, I didn't have to do it. Uh -huh. Or they are for, you know, this is my idea and I, you're going to have mm -hmm. to put it in your movie. Well, this is the whole area around which the question usually comes up. Is film an art or is film a business? Mm -hmm. And, you know, film is just film. And it's, it's whatever a human being makes of it that, right. you know, that, that, that puts these qualities into it. The problem is that making film is an art. Selling film is a business. Right. The trouble is that they don't know how to sell films. Uh -huh. As a result, they try to make you make films that people will go to without them having to be sold, uh -huh. which is the real key to the problem. And if they weren't so backward and, you know, I mean, they just, if, it's, if, it's, if they can't put a film in a theater and have people rush to the door, they're not interested. Well, they only, you know, you they know, don't in one know sense, what selling THX is. THX is a very traditional kind of a movie. I mean, for example, it has all the qualities right. that one usually expects to find in any kind of a cliffhanger, chiller, futuristic kind of a movie. You have the doomed love affair. Mm -hmm. You have the, uh, the very um, impressive technological ambiance that's there. You have, the, you have the chase sequence. Now, I mean, how many thousands of movies have had chase sequences uh, which are just absolutely guaranteed to hold an audience? And this right. is uh, which we said earlier was why uh, the short version of Thex was so uh, you know, tight and impressive because it was just that. Um, and so it, it, it does seem that, uh, you know, wh what upset them? I mean, all the well, ingredients were the, there. The big issue was the fact that I had certain ideas. I mean, it was a cliché film. It was a, you know, kind of slapstick, old-time movie mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, the Brave New World 1984 thing. And they saw it as Brave New World 1984, and they wanted it to be an oppressive society. Uh, I kept, I wanted it to be a film about now, about the way I saw the world in 1969. Mm -hmm. The way I saw Los Angeles in 1969, that was the, that was the <laughs> idea of the film. And uh -huh. they wanted it to be in the 25th century someplace. And the point of the film wasn't the love story. I mean, that did, yeah, it was just a, a small mm -hmm. vehicle but in the beginning. The point of the story was the, you know, Thex and his realization, you know, more existential ideas involved in making his step to leave, you know. Mm -hmm. And they, all they saw it was the love story and the action and the adventure and all that kind of what, stuff. What, what, ha what happened? What did they say to you? Did they get really nasty and, and, uh, and uh, I mean, what, what, what really, you seem to be so upset by this. Well, uh, I, you know, I'm not really, I'm just upset, at, I'm more upset at the idea. You know, I, it's, it's more of a young idealist facing the reality of the fact that these people exist. It's, I guess, what most kids face when they see the government. I mean, it's uh, the same thing as the government. I just face it with Warner Brothers. It's, um, there are certain freedoms that people expect, yeah. you know, and certain respect that people, ex you know, to ideas, the respect of the idea. Coming out of school, I mean, you respect the idea more than when you realize that in the real world they don't even know what an idea is, right. and they just walk all over it. Well, and, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing that really makes you angry. Well, the chase sequence was, I, I guess, uh, I, you probably resent anybody talking about any one sequence all the time mm -hmm. as being a representative of the film, because I'm sure you have uh, your own favorites. But uh, I thought it was extremely well done and had a, a, a very dynamic quality uh, about it uh, involving these jet cars and so on. And you, you were saying something about why you had jet cars uh, in this tunnel. The, the thing that carries throughout the film is the kind of human factor, the fact that everything isn't the way it should be because human beings don't make things the way they should be. They make them the way they want them to be. And that's the big thing in the film where there's so much kind of askew things, you know. People design futuristic societies and they're perfect, uh -huh. but society isn't perfect. So the jet car so chase was, was a kind of, jet, a, to be paradoxical. And yeah, it was also as a matter of, I wanted to get a very large car. I wanted it, it has to do with man, machine. Uh -huh. The film relies basically on themes and everything has a theme. <laughs> Statistical method used to test the construction of the K-34 determiner proves its analogy to the J-20 series. 
I guess you finally got to indulge your um, <coughs> love of automobiles with the chase sequence, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was one of the things behind it. I always loved it. Vicarious I, participation. Right. Well, I love cars and I love chases. And it was, that was a lot of fun. It was, you know, it was also it was, was that man-machine thing of the fact that, uh -huh. that man, uh, you know, his relationship to the machine and his dependence on it and yeah. his, you know, lack of control of it. Well, that brings up something that I think, you know, this whole discussion has, has really been lacking up to now, and that is the whole man-machine dependency or independency as it regards what we think of as film. And, um, you know, my experience with this has been from uh, at an age, you know, about, I'm, we're about the same age, and I began writing film criticism, and, it's, and it soon became clear to me that what I was trying to do was reform the audience. 
-hmm. and really not write film criticism uh, as is done in, in most newspapers. And then it became clear to me that, that, you know, what you really do not do, you don't reform human beings, you know, you reform the environment that they're living in, and that takes care of the problem. And so, you know, with regard to all this that we've been talking about, about the, the, the almost impossibility of doing anything that has any real integrity within the industry and so on, and really having any, any latitude and artistic uh, inventiveness, the, there are certain developments that are going on now and that will, within 10 years, within this decade, really result in a totally new kind of filmmaking and viewing environment. And that has to do with the, what I call the decentralization of, the, of, of where all the energy comes from and, and the, and the distri distribution of it. And uh, mainly through cable television and cassette, videotape cassette distribution over cable. Um, there's one thing that, you know, that we really haven't discussed, and that is that the very nature of filmmaking as it has existed for almost like 40 years, uh, or more 40, 50 years, with the exceptions of the beginning of film, has been this highly centralized thing in which it costs so much money to make a movie that you had to address the broadest, lowest common denominator type of an audience to get the most people to pay the most dollars to go into the theater and see this film, and therefore it developed what I, what I call uh, perceptual imperialism. That is to say that you have to develop certain genres, certain kinds of languages in film to get your audience to come back over and over again to pay that mm -hmm. three or six bucks, to have that same kind of experience that they had the last time, that it made them forget about how bad work is at the office, so forth and so on. And it developed in the kind of situation you have today and where no creative work can be done. Well, the evolution of technology and especially of communications technologies uh, and videotape cassettes and cable really means the end of all this. Right. For example, in like in book writing or well, Jean Cocteau once said that film will never become an art until the filmmaker is as free as the writer with his pen and piece of paper. That is until you can push one button and take that image and then that's it, then you really will never be a film poet. And uh, the, the, the things that are happening in, with cassette distribution and cable now really imply that, um, that I would say surely within 10 years, but probably sooner than that because all the cassettes are supposed to be out within three years from now that you will have that kind of freedom. Because it means that, uh, that you won't have to address a mass audience. Mm -hmm. You won't have to go through this giant corporate structure and reach millions of people to justify the film that you've made. Right, it's, it's the, the real problem now is that stranglehold that the distributors and the exhibitors have over, yeah. uh, over the filmmaker. Because the, that's the only way you can make any money back to recoup your costs of making the production. Right. And as long as they have that stranglehold, they're, you know, we're just going right. to keep, you know, trying right. to get things done and never get them done. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that really in terms of the mass audience, the problem is that the, the people that are selling movies only want movies that they don't have to sell. And I bring that up again. Of course, it's, right. It's, it's their thinking, it's their laziness in terms of selling movies that is the thing that's going to, mm -hmm. you know, make cassettes so so exciting anyway because of the fact that then you're going to have a much better sales program and you'll be able to sell your 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 wares directly to the people and you won't have to sell as well, much I mean, you uh, don't have to sell it, it's far more revolutionary millions, millions. it's far more revolutionary than that for example there there is not now nor has there ever been any such thing as a mass audience right. this is an illusion that's imposed upon the society by a means of distributing information and this society is in, uh, has been for the last 20 years and is now really on its way in a transformation from a society whose economy is based on hard capital to a society whose economy is information. I mean, the corporations, the, uh, the, the major uh, economic force of this country is information processing, whether it's done by a computer or an executive or whatever, whether it's done by a public television like we're doing right now, it's all information. And, uh, it, the whole society is developing to the point where you're going to have, instead of one mass audience, a hundred small specialized audiences. But since it's a global distribution network, you know, uh, cassette, uh, video cassettes are now a global system mm -hmm. with like 30 or 40 cassette manufacturers all around the world. Um, a specialized audience on a global scale is bigger than a mass audience on a national scale. So that you can make a kind of film you want to make addressed to the people who want to see that kind of film and nobody else right. and, and, and be far more aesthetically and financially successful than anyone ever has been in the Hollywood industry, right. you see. 
uh, and I think uh, a few other things are going to come from this. First of all, it'll literally change the kinds of films that are being made. Right. I mean, this is the, old, the idea of the, of the uh, medium being the message and so well, on. Well, it'll get, it'll let more people make films. It'll, right. Anybody can make a film then, which is really the point of the whole thing, and get it down You to become, the individual becomes the equivalent of, 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 of Warner Brothers. Right. Because you can put, say if you had $5,000, you put it into a 16 millimeter film, you, you make that. Someone, Warner Brothers is making its $5 million super spectacular. They all come down on the same cassettes. Right. The distribution is the very same thing. And then it just, it's just a one-to-one -one relationship. And, and then the question is decided, you know, which one of these films is the most viable? Which one will people want to see the most? You know? And uh, we're into a whole new kind of experience there. It's the same thing as in book publishing, where, if, where finally, finally in film, it's going to be talent that counts and not economic power. Right. Yeah. That's, you know, and you're not going to have a lot of, you know, 12 people between you and the audience deciding what the audience wants. Right. You know, it's just going to be you, and if right. you bring it out and nobody wants to see it, then nobody's right. going to see it. But if people want to see it, then they'll buy it. It's not, you don't have all this second guessing, which is right. what really destroys. You have the exhibitor second guessing the distributor, and the distributor second guessing the exhibitor, and, and everybody ends up trying to second guess the filmmaker. Absolutely. You know, about what we know what the audience wants. You know, I mean, and they, none of them know what the audience wants. Right. You know, nobody knows what the audience and, wants. And the audience itself doesn't know what it wants right. because it hasn't ever, in the history of film, ever been given the chance to find out what it wants right. because we've had no choice. If you turn on your TV set, you have seven channels of junk that you didn't select to be there, and you have no choice but to turn it off, which is no choice at all. The definite ratio between the, the amount of choice that's available to you and the kinds of reactions you, you're liable to have to various things that go on in society. For example, uh, along this idea of, of perceptual imperialism that I, that I talk about in movies, the, the kinds of attitudes about life that are expressed in films must assume this, again, they must address themselves to what, uh, evidently, what these hundred million viewers are, are, are obviously thinking about, you know. Uh, therefore, attitudes about w what is the nature of love and life and how one behaves and the kinds of meanings and values that one associates with being an American and so forth, all of these are implicit in, in most all films made. Um, and then recently, it was very interesting, Easy Rider comes out, and you, you mentioned Easy Rider earlier as being, mm -hmm. as being instrumental in, in um, setting up a kind of an environment uh, of relative freedom in the industry that permitted you to do your film. Mm -hmm. um, now here comes along Easy Rider, which, which evidently uh, really impressed a lot of people as being some kind of film about the death of America, or death of some, I don't know what, you know. But it just struck me when I saw that film that here was a film that to me was the most traditional thing that one could think of. It had all, you know, all the elements of a, of a traditional dramatic uh, beginning, middle, end, uh, suspense kind of a narrative. Uh, with the exception that it just had a, a few different meanings and values associated with it. And this caused a great furor, a great, you know, oh, big turmoil. This became a big deal. But, but if you have in cassette and cable distribution literally hundreds and thousands of different expressions from hundreds and thousands of different people, you know, artists, multiplicity of voices on, about what constitutes reality, you're, not, you're going to find an enormous change in the political and economic structure of the entire country. Well, I mean, the, the thing is that most of the really interesting oddballs in this world <laughs> have been filtered out right. of, most, of most media. So yeah. you don't really get the really interesting things. I mean, all, all the all the offshoots and all the really crazy right. things are, you know, all the Van Goghs of the world are sent off into a corner someplace. If I had anything really to say about your film, <laughs> would be this, that I know that there's this feeling on the part of a lot of people in this country and the world about technology. In fact, it's, it's, it's the most traditional feeling, the Faustian view of technology, that we've sold our soul to the devil for this. But, um, you know, in fact, Technology is evolving to this decentralization of power, mm -hmm. so that so that from a from a monolithic structured uh, uh, entertainment industry that we've suffered under for 70 years, the the very technology that's putting uh, the man on the moon is also helping you to bring you 80 channels of cable television. It's all interlinked in, into one into one system. Um, right now, two things are being decided this year, uh, w w within within 10 years, that are going to result in in, in the most dramatic changes that this country has ever known, and that is the unlimited access to information and the unlimited access to uh, physical energy through nuclear uh, fusion, nuclear power. Right. So I, I would just say that maybe it's time to stop talking and to start working, huh, George? All right. So let's, let's get at it. Uh, in Zotrope, you're going to start uh, producing uh, a lot of educational and uh, 
uh, industrial type films, right. aren't you? We're moving and into that market. It's a valuable market. There's there's enough money in it to make a strong financial background, and then we're doing something worthwhile. You know, it's like uh -huh. teaching is. Ha you know, have you been talking key. to any of the cast people? Uh, yeah, some people have. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we've, you know, that it's so new that it's hard. I mean, they don't, you know, they're all running around. Yeah.